In the days of Noah, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the hearts of his heart was evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he'd made man on the earth and it grieved him in his heart. And the word there in Hebrew is it cut him, it hurt him, it pained him, it cut him to the heart. He saw the wickedness of man. It was the wickedness of man that grieved and cut and hurt and bruised the heart of God. Think of the children being raped in our daycare centers. They're stripping our little children, having them make pornographic films. What about millions of children now angry and full of rebellion, wanting revenge against their parents because they're splitting up? Can you imagine what's going to happen just 10, 15 years from now when these millions of kids from broken homes full of anger, resentment, rebellion begin to explode because they have no Christ to rely on? Mad masses of hard-hearted young people with no moral foundation. I said about television, Deuteronomy 7:26. Neither shall thou bring an abomination where, lest you become what, a cursed thing like it, or the band which is cursed, but thou so utterly detest it, thou so utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. What curses it? Because Satan has used it as his number one tool now to destroy the vitality of the church of Jesus Christ and take away the diligence of the coming of the Lord, the diligence of righteousness, and it's put a people to sleep. And my Bible says, how shall we escape? We, we, God's people, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That doesn't mean neglect prayer. doesn't mean neglect reading the Bible. How shall we escape if we neglect the salvation of the lost city? How do we escape if we neglect the salvation of our family? This is a great salvation for the whole world. But how can you even talk about it if your heart's not right? If your heart's not right. Jeremiah 12, verse 10. Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my present portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it desolate and being desolate. It mourneth unto me. The whole land is made desolate. Why? Because no man lays it to heart. No man is diligent about it. No man's upset about it. No man's concerned about it. I was walking down Broadway, 70th Street, around 70th Street the other night, and I was weeping. I couldn't help it. I was looking at all the masses of people coming up from work and listening to the horns and looking at those masses of people. And I was thinking, 
about this great salvation and how do we escape? How do I escape if I neglect this great salvation that's free to all? And I said, oh God, must they all be damned? Must so many be damned? There's such a small handful of Christians. You know what I heard? And it just broke me. I started to weep as though he came down and put a finger right on my chest and pointed a finger at me. And he stopped me dead in my tracks. I was weeping. He said, David, if not you, who? Who's he going to touch the city with? Who's going to fast? Who's going to pray? If not those whose hearts have been stirred, if not those who've been looking at the word of the Lord and say, oh God, I can't live a double life. I can't live a lie. I'm not going to call you Lord. Lord, go sit in front of my idols. If God can't find us, if not you, then who? Who's going to weep for the city? Who's going to pray? If not you praying for your unsafe family, who? Who's God going to get? Where's he going to find somebody? Where? And if you don't go there to pray, who goes? If not you, who? And it hit me. And ever since then, I've just a few days now, every waking moment, if not you, David, if you won't seek my face, if you won't humble yourself, if you won't give yourself to prayer, if you won't give yourself wholly to me, like Jeremiah, like Isaiah, like Ezekiel, you say, well, Brother Dick, you mean to tell me that after working all day on the job, I've got to carry another burden after that. I want to go home and relax. You mean to tell me I've got to weep over the lost? You mean I've got to live like Jesus did? That I've got to break away and pray? Even though I've been out ministering to people, I've got to still break away and pray? And then I've got to go to a cross and I've got to die to self and sin? Yes, yes, yes. It all depends on whether you believe God's word is true or not. It all depends whether you believe judgment is coming. It all depends on whether you just say, well, things are going to continue as they were from the beginning of time. No. God's saying it's enough. How shall we escape if we neglect, if we become careless? We're not laying it to heart. Heavenly Father, draw me nearer, Jesus. Draw me nearer to you. Let my heart burn for you. Let my heart burn after righteousness. Lord, cleanse me. Drive out all the idolatry and all the adultery and the lust and fill my heart with you, Jesus. Fill my heart with you, Jesus. Does it really matter to you that your unsafe loved ones are dying and we're getting closer and closer to the end? Does it really concern you? They could die and go to hell. Even though you're a lover of Christ. Some very, very troubling, difficult times just ahead and, and comes not only from the Pope, but it comes from politicians coming from all over the world. Folks, it's getting late and it's getting serious. Please don't tell me. Don't tell me you're concerned. Don't tell me that you want your unsaved loved ones saved when you're spending hours in front of internet or television. Where's the anguish? Where are the tears? Where's the mourning? Where, where's the fasting? Where's the getting up in the middle of the night? Prophet Amos cried out to such, Woe to them that are ease in Zion, eating, chanting their music, but they're not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. And in the original Hebrew root word, they are not agonizing in prayer over the ruin in, uh, in, Jeru in Joseph or Israel. They're not agonizing, they're not in anguish about the conditions. Comedy, yes. Happy singing, yes. Eating, fellowship, good time, yes. Weeping, anguish, praying, fasting, no, no, no. Do not have it. Where's the confessing of your sins and of your children? Confessing your children's sins before the Lord or your mate's sin before God because this is exactly what Nehemiah does. He confesses his sins and the sins of all the people.
And then he says, we have sinned. I have sinned. And then he said, we have sinned. See, when Nehemiah heard of the ruin and destruction, he never asked why. Why can a holy, just God allow his city to go to ruin? Why were so many dispersed? Why were so many killed and murdered? He didn't ask the question that we're asking in America today. Why did God allow the towers to fall and over 2,000 people died in the crash? How could a loving God... And Folks, just, I, I share what Pastor Carter said today, the holy anger that arises in my heart when I hear preachers on television or, or, or on radio or hear that they've said on television, oh, God had nothing to do with it. God had nothing to do with it. Don't put it on God. That this was God allowing America to be wakened. God didn't do it. He didn't stop the plans of the enemy because he had a greater purpose because it was love for America that was about to slip into everlasting hell. I want to ask you, why, why did Nehemiah, of all God-fearing men that were left in Israel, why did God share his anguished heart with Nehemiah? Because he was a man of prayer. He was already in prayer. Now I want to tell you something. I believe in, I believe in destiny. I believe that God chooses men. But God can choose a man and he can abort it just like that. Nehemiah could have said, look, I, 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 I'm, I have more influence right here. I have the ear of the king. I, I need to stay right here. And God, I'm sure has, I'll agree with you that God will raise up somebody. No, he, he said, oh God, this is my burden. Open your heart to me. You see, you, you, you either walk away and go back to your passivity and say, I'm just going to be an ordinary Christian and there's no such thing. Or your heart begins to cry out, Oh God, your name is being blasphemed. The Holy Spirit's being mocked. The enemy is out trying to destroy the testimony of the Lord's faithfulness and something has to be done. You can't go unchallenged. You see, a true prayer life begins at the place of anguish, a place where lifetime decisions are made. You see, if you, you set your heart to pray, God's going to come and start sharing your heart, His heart with you. He's going to open up His heart and I'll tell you there's pain in His heart. But he sees it's so few to hear. He's going to show you the condition of his church. He's going to show you the condition of your own heart. And he's going to ask you a question. What is it to you? What is it? See, you have to make a decision. You're going to come and he says, Now, if you're going to bear my burden, if you're going to be an instrument of restoration, if you are expecting somebody else to be an instrument to win your family or to do this work, you're mistaken. I've burned your heart. I've given you my heart and I've opened up my anguish to you and I'm letting you feel it and share it so that it will bring you to your knees. And I've never had anything that's been any worth to God in my 50 years that wasn't born in agony. Never, never, and I know the sermons won't do it. I know that a new revelation won't do it, covenant won't do it. No anguish, no fasting, no prayer, no brokenness. Let's just do it. Nothing would have been done. The walls would have never been rebuilt. Anything you try to do without this baptism of anguish, it's going to falter and fall. It's not going to work. And when you begin to seek his face, you allow him to melt and break you. You come into this communion with the Lord. Out of that 
experience. You see, God has called us to live in anguish. This is the birth, this is the womb of something God is stirring, God wanting to accomplish in, in bringing out of ruin, restoration in your family, whatever it may be. The servant who willingly takes on the mantle of God's pain is the only servant who has the authority and the right to hold God to his covenant promises. We preach covenant here. But only those who've known his heart and in those times have allowed God to bring healing, has allowed God to go down deep in the soul and show God, I can't do this on my own, but I'm not going to let my kids go to hell. I'm not going to let my husband and my wife. Oh God, I'm not going to live in this death. I'm not going to live in this lukewarmness and this coldness anymore. God, change me. And when you get desperate before God, you set your heart to seek Him. Then you can hold God to His covenant promises. Look, look at first chapter verses 8 and 9. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you brought among the nations. Now, he, he holds God this covenant now. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, Though there were most of you cast out from the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather thee, them from thence and bring them into this place that I've chosen to set my name there. He calls on the covenant made to Moses. He said, here's what you promised, God. And folks, when you allow God to lead you into this place beyond concern, beyond just fleeting emotion, you say, God, I'm going to sit in my heart. Then you have every right to hold God to every one of his covenant promises. There's going to be no renewal, no revival, no awakening until we're willing to let him once again break us. I want my heart broken again. Lord, I want you to take me into your heart. Something that laid hold of my heart this morning. I was reading in Revelation 7. In the seventh chapter of Revelation, there's a, an account of an unnumbered multitude, a multitude that can't be numbered, standing before God's throne. A multitude that no man could number from every nation and from all people, all tongues, and all nations, in white robes, praising the Lord. And John, so overwhelmed by the sight of these white-robed multitudes worshiping, and he said, where did these come from? Who are these people? And the, the answer was, these are those who have come out of great tribulation. They've come out of great tribulation. Now, that describes many, many martyrs all down through the ages that have paid with their life. They've come through tribulation. But it doesn't answer, I believe, to this great multitude that's come out of great tribulation. Somewhere, somebody... In, in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of darkness, in the midst of tribulation. Now, I, these came out of great tribulation. Somebody's been preaching to them. Somebody has been lifting up the light. The light is still shining through tribulation. And a great multitude have come out of this tribulation. Folks, my point is this. No matter how dark it gets, no matter how difficult we can't stop doing what God has called us to do. We can't, we can't pull back what God has called us to do. <sighs> Folks, I've ministered to you in weakness, but I know that God is speaking. 
I know God is bringing a word to our hearts. I stood in this pulpit years ago in the first service when we dedicated it. And I told that congregation just about what exactly what I'm telling you now. After all these years and all the people that have been saved, the multitudes have been saved. These altars have always been graced with numbers of people that are coming to Christ. And I've prayed, God, in my time, as long as I live, let me see, let me be a part of what you're doing right up to the last breath or till Jesus comes either. Folks, I tell you now, with the Spirit of the Lord on me, that as long as this church exists, as long as there are men of God in the pulpit, the best wine has been saved for the last. The best wine has been saved for the last. This is God's hour of deliverance. This is God's hour of power. This is not just an hour of judgment. This is for the church of Jesus Christ, its finest hour. And I, my heart is rejoicing. My heart is absolutely on fire with anticipation. Your sons and daughters your grandchildren there's going to be something of conviction there's going to be something of an anointing there's going to be such an outpouring of this new wine I hear the sound of rain an abundance of rain an abundance of rain <laughs>